How's everybody doing? All right. Great. What a polite crowd. You, you start talk, stop talking just as I get up. Isn't that that's just wonderful? Um, how's the workshops going? All right? All right. Please fill out your evaluations. We, want to spend, we really pay attention to them, and we, we try to take the time to make sure every year we improve both on the substance of those workshops as well as the, the presenters. So your feedback is greatly appreciated. And if you think of something that we ought to be offering here that we're not, just let us know. So a couple of things first is um, everybody got their phone? We're, we're, we're told by all the regulators that all poor people have phones now and they don't need branches. So you, you, you know, so we all, we all must have phones, right? All right. So hashtag just economy. And if you're over 50, just turn to someone at the table who's under 40 and they'll explain the hashtag and, and how all that works. But let me say, um, we tweeted a piece um, from uh, Maxine Waters' speech yesterday. Who's, who's being noisy over there? Is that my staff? We tweeted a piece from Maxine yesterday, and she tweeted on the heels of it on, with a the hashtag just economy, and 1,700 other people tweeted on that. So get your phones out. I'm going to introduce Mr. Curry in a second. He's going to say things that you want to want to let people know about. Or maybe I'll say something you want to let people know about. But in any case, um, speaking of which, you'll notice in the center of your table there are these white cards and some pens. Uh, uh, Comptroller Curry, Curry has graciously agreed to accept questions, uh, a limited number because of his schedule, but he'll take a few at the end. So what you fill out your question right legibly, please. That really helps making it your question to the stage. And um, uh, if you look for an NCRC staff person. They're around. They're wearing a uh, what color t p ribbon? White. Uh, they're wearing a white ribbon. and. Um, just give it to them and we'll, we'll pass it through the process and pick the ones that seem to be the most on point. So um, look, I'm actually quite happy. Some of you know that I've known Comptroller Thomas Curry for many years. And the reason I know is uh, because he's from Boston, he's from Massachusetts. But more importantly, having worked for several governors in Massachusetts as uh, the banking commissioner, he had a lot to do with CRA and was, from our experience as community groups, very supportive, very responsive, even supportive in, in, in creating the rules around expanding, you could now get this, expanding CRA to credit unions. Not a lot of states can say that. I think Connecticut might be the other one. Looks like you're getting ready to come up. So I should, uh, I should move on, all right. <laughs> so, no, I've known him for many years. It, Tom, uh, Comptroller Curry uh, supervises 2,000 national banks and about 50 uh, affiliates of foreign banks that do business in the United States and elsewhere. And um, that's about two-thirds of all the assets in banking is under his purview. Um, look, he's been the director of the FDIC. He was very active in NeighborWorks. NeighborWorks, which, by the way, is something we've got to protect. It's under attack. And it's, it plays an important role in our uh, world of community development. And uh, I think it's, if you've been paying attention, you see that it's, it's one of the new targets. And we're going to make sure that they're not injured in the process. So let me end by saying, um, if you ever have difficulty trying to get to a cabinet member or a member of Congress, try to get on the uh, 4.30 flight out of Washington that's <laughs> going to your state because those are called the congressional flights. And most of my meetings with Tom Curry have actually happened on that flight and coming back from Boston, because we both commute. But also, I, I would run into a slew of members of Congress and I wouldn't leave them alone until we got to Boston. So good strategy if you're looking for FaceTime with one-on-one. -on -one. So please join me in welcoming a dear friend, the head of the national banking system, Comptroller Thomas Curry. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thank you, John, for that very warm welcome. And uh, 
It's amazing how you uh, form relationships in your professional career and uh, how long they last and uh, how be mutually beneficial they can be. So thank you, John, for our long association. Uh, uh, I just want to talk this, uh, this afternoon a little bit about uh, uh, N uh, N NCRC's consumer protection agenda. Uh, and I know it's broad, but I really want to commend you uh, for your uh, current focus on older Americans uh, with its National Neighbors Silver Program and the uh, age-friendly banking campaign. Uh, NCRC, oh, oh, very good. <laughs> NCRC has taken to heart uh, the cause of serving the financial needs of seniors. And the agenda for this conference includes uh, a workshop and several sessions highlighting uh, efforts aimed at seniors and best practices to protect older individuals from financial exploitation. And my remarks uh, this afternoon will focus on these concerns as well, because this topic is both timely and of significant interest to the OCC, and uh, unfortunately also important to me as a baby boomer with increasing gray hair, even though it's not as uh, gray as John's. Uh, seniors are quite an important customer uh, segment for banks. Uh, nine in ten of the households in the 65 plus age group have an existing banking relationship. In coming years, serving the financial needs of an aging customer base will become ev ever more important for banks. Uh, the baby boomers are swelling in size uh, of the over 65 age group which will grow from about 13% uh, today to 20% by 2030. I was particularly intrigued by the NCRC report, A New Dawn, Age-Friendly Banking, and its observation that older customers want banks to help them avoid fraud and financial abuse. My remarks will focus on the role that banks can play in protecting the assets of senior citizens. The National Center on Elder Abuse defines elder abuse as, quote, the illegal or improper use of an older adult's funds, property, or assets, end quote. Older individuals are more susceptible to financial abuse for a number of reasons. Physical limitations, such as vision or hearing loss, or cognitive impairment can reduce their ability to understand or manage their financial affairs. These factors, as well as a lack of mobility, often lead seniors to depend more on others for their physical well-being as well as their financial care. Seniors are a tempting and lucrative target for financial fraud. As the bank robber Willie Sutton allegedly said, I rob banks that because that's where the money is. In households 65 and older, the average net worth, excluding home equity, is slightly over $500,000, and the average value of their home equity is $190,000. Increasingly, seniors are funding their retirement with savings and IRA or 401k plans, and these accounts can be quickly drained by fraudsters. For older individuals who have fewer assets and limited income, the impact of financial fraud can be even more devastating. Fraudsters targeting the elderly use an imaginative array of scams. I think we're all familiar with the home repair and telemarketing uh, scams that are uh, widespread. Some stoke fear that a loved one is desperate and needs money or that a senior must pay a fine immediately or face arrest for a fictitious charge. Others promise a large sweepstakes payout after inducing vulnerable seniors to make an upfront payment that will supposedly cover taxes. Financial exploitation may also involve unscrupulous investment advisors who peddle expensive or unsuitable annuities or investment pyramid schemes. Technology also has opened a new door to fraud with identity theft and internet phishing where false emails ask for bank information. Affinity fraud is commonplace. A senior's new best friend 
may simply be building trust in order to drain an older person's bank account. Seniors may also trust a fiduciary agent or a caregiver enough to sign documents giving up ownership or authority over their assets and bank accounts. But the saddest fact is that a large portion of financial elder abuse is per 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 uh, per perpetrated by family members. It's hard to know the extent of the problem because there is evidence that these activities are significantly underreported. And we do know that the risks are significant. A 2011 report by the MetLife Mature Market Institute estimated that seniors lose over $2.9 billion annually. In, the, in my view, banks can play a critical role in identifying financial fraud and protecting their older customers against these losses. An FDIC survey of banked and underbanked households found that over half of seniors 65 or older rely on bank tellers to access their accounts. Frontline bank staff who interact with older customers are in a position to watch for unusual transactions. Taking the time to ask a few questions could potentially stop fraud in its tracks. Financial institution regulators have also taken steps to inform the banking industry and consumers about the potential for and types of elder financial exploitation as well as how to clarify to, as well as to clarify how financial institutions should report any suspicious activities. So what can banks do in this connection? First, banks must file suspicious activity reports, or SARS, with the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, if they identify suspicious activity meeting the SAR reporting thresholds. We typically think of SARS as a weapon against money laundering, but they are also an important early warning system to alert enforcement authorities and identify financial fraud trends. Indeed, in 2011, FinCEN issued guidance instructing financial institutions to file SARS when they suspect that older customers are being subjected to financial abuse. The suspicious activity reporting form was subsequently improved by adding a separate checkbox to flag elder financial abuse. These uh, steps led to a sharp increase in SAR filings about these potential crimes. Uh, just a few figures, only 1,600 SARs cited financial elder abuse in the year before FinCEN issued its revised guidelines. In contrast, between March uh, of 2012 and the end of 2014, Depository institutions filed over 27,000 SARs involving suspected elder financial exploitation. Banks must ensure their Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering compliance programs provide training to employees. To this end, banks may consider whether to include specific training modules regarding elder abuse for certain employees. Training can be designed to help employees understand indicators of elder abuse, the products and services targeted, and what to look for during suspicious activity investigations. Under the SAR rules, banks are encouraged to file copies of SARs with state and local enforcement agencies where appropriate, including SARs that report alleged elder abuse. This has inevitably raised some privacy concerns. To, raise, to address these concerns, in 2013, the OCC joined with our sister regulatory agencies to issue interagency guidance on privacy laws and reporting financial abuse of older adults, <coughs> which explains certain exceptions to the Graham-Leach-Bliley uh, Act's privacy protection provisions that allow banks to share non-public personal information with federal, state, and local authorities under appropriate circumstances. The agencies belie believe that prompt reporting of suspected financial exploitation to adult protective services and law enforcement agencies 
can trigger appropriate intervention, prevent financial loss, or provide other appropriate remedies. This interagency guidance also highlighted for banks possible signs of abuse, such as erratic or unusual banking transactions or changes in banking patterns, as well as potential warning flags banks should look for in their interactions with older adults or their caregivers. Finally, banks can improve their marketing and financial education materials to raise their customers' awareness of potentially fraudulent activities and enhance seniors' abilities to protect themselves against fraud. In a recent report, FinCEN observed that the narratives that filers provided in uh, suspicious activity reports revealed that bankers were careful to assess suspicious transactions, often questioning an elderly customer if a transaction appeared out of character. I am also pleased with FinCEN's conclusion that many banks have incorporated elder financial exploitation guidance into their compliance monitoring programs. State and local law enforcement and social services agencies also play a significant role in protecting the elderly. Ten states mandate and many others encourage financial institutions to report suspected cases of financial abuse of the elderly, and 49 states and the District of Columbia provide immunity from civil or criminal liability to financial institutions for reporting their suspicions. It is important that bank employees are familiar with the, the applicable state or local regulatory, regulatory requirements to alert law enforcement or adult protective services when they suspect elder financial exploitation. As the problem of elder financial abuse has become more acute, some banks are doing more than simply meeting basic requirements to report abuse. A number of banks have developed materials to educate their customers about fraud and identity theft. Also, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau have collaborated on a training curriculum called Money Smart for Older Adults, covering how to prevent elder financial exploitation and, importantly, encouraging advanced planning and informed financial decision making. Bankers may also be in a position to help customers plan ahead to transition management of their financial affairs as they get older to protect against financial abuse. For example, a limited access account that enables someone else to view account activity but not to make transactions may allow a senior to maintain financial control while letting a concerned family member or a caretaker keep a watchful eye to ensure bills are getting paid and there are no signs of potential fraud or exploitation. When seniors come into the bank to discuss their investment or retirement accounts, this may be an, an opportunity to review options for managing their financial affairs. It's always best for consumers to think ahead and plan instead of reacting in the midst of a crisis. Bankers, however, should exercise an abundance of caution in marketing and selling investment products to seniors. This past January, the OCC updated our examination guidance to incorporate regulatory changes and interagency statements that affect banks' securities-related activities. Senior clients should receive heightened investor protection depending on their needs, objectives, risk tolerance, investment experience, and understanding. With the low interest rate environment we are in today, seniors may be tempted to reach for yield and can be susceptible to taking on greater and possibly inappropriate investment risk. Senior clients, however, may not have the ability to absorb or recover from the loss of principal. Banks should ensure that appropriate procedures are implemented for making critical suitability determinations involving sales to older bank clients. Finally, training can also help frontline bank staff recognize potential sides of fraud 
and provide information about the steps that they should take to prevent, to protect their older customers. The Financial Services Roundtable, a banking industry trade association, has developed a fraud protection toolkit specifically addressing financial fraud and exploitation of the elderly and, and the vulnerable. This manual details the warning signs and types of financial exploitation. The training guide lays out the fraud protection roles of both staff with direct customer contact as well as the back office departments responsible for loss prevention, security, or legal matters. In addressing the problem of elder financial abuse and exploitation, banks, regulators, and organizations like NCRC all have an important role to play. It is personally gratifying to me that under John's leadership, NCRC is doing its part to protect this vulnerable segment of our population. And I would like to thank all of you and the organizations that you work for for your continued commitment to improving access to financial services. And I look forward to your questions this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Curry. Um, would you, in, uh, first question, would you support expanding CRA assessment areas to where banks may not have branches, but where they do a significant amount of lending and other banking business? And for that matter, uh, what's the status on a further CRA regulatory reform? Right. Um, definitely, John, I think your question goes to the real fundamental issue uh, facing CRA is uh, the impact of technological change uh, in changing uh, demographic and uh, uh, tastes uh, by bank customers. So, uh, you know, I think John and I are old enough to remember when the CRA came into existence, that was uh, really the dark ages of technology, and there's been a, a rapid change in the way banking services have been delivered. So that really is a fundamental uh, issue facing the CRA. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, uh, some, uh, to address that would require legislative action as opposed to uh, strictly regulatory uh, 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 intervention. Uh, so, uh, so you think that the <coughs> prudential regulators don't have the authority to designate where a bank does a significant amount of business, whether it has a branch or not, as part of its CRA assessment uh, area? CRA is... Uh, basically hardwired for a geographical uh, uh, tie-in. And I think this is something both uh, you know, the, uh, the banking agencies and organizations like yours have recognized yeah. that we need to address. Yeah. Okay, because I love you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll let you go on that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I would point out, I mean, you, the second part of your question, uh, you know, the approach that we've taken is really to use the uh, uh, CRA Q&A process to deal with all yeah. of those other areas that are a result of changes in the banking marketplace, but that are not constrained by statutory language. Right. Okay. So, uh, well, let me ask this one. Uh, the current grades that are passed out for a, mm -hmm. a, a passing CRA grade is outstanding, mm -hmm. satisfactory, needs to improve, and substantial noncompliance. Would you support adding a fifth one, which basically says low satisfactory? So you kind of really distinguish between the, the mass of the pack where everybody gets a passing grade and, um, and those who are actually doing well and are almost outstanding and those who just mm -hmm. barely passed. It would, I think, be a, one more accurate, but also mm -hmm. be very helpful to us to have that kind of a grade in the, in the system. That is something you can do. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you yeah. know, more granularity is always helpful, but uh -huh. I also think that in terms of uh, you know, the goal of the ratings is really to give a picture of the record of performance of the institution. I think there's other you know, ways to provide that information as well. I think it goes to the quality of the, of the public evaluation, the performance evaluation, uh, and the <laughs> level of, uh, of uh, uh, scrutiny that uh, our examiners and the comments that we receive from uh, interested parties. So uh, uh, the NCRC board met with mm -hmm. Chairman Yellen mm -hmm. uh, a couple of days ago and, and raised this uh, same subject. We, we've had an incredible amount of uh, attorney general suits in different mm -hmm. states from the Justice Department. 
uh, we've had uh, what we all know from the work we do, a, a real dearth of small business lending. You can look at the HUMDA data and see housing, is, housing lending is down. On top of all that, branches are closing all over LMI areas, and yet 99% of the banks get a passing CRA grade, and last time I looked, the tests were lending, servicing, mm -hmm. and investments. And it seems like in all those areas, we're taking a, we're going backwards. So one, I think, again, low satisfactory would be a good signal on who's mm -hmm. just getting by. Mm -hmm. But also, can you sort of reconcile what we know to be the experience of essentially a retrenchment by the banking community in LMI areas, and yet a continuance of what we call grade inflation of mm -hmm. CRA exams? Okay. Um, no, I think, uh, you know, going even back to your first question, I mean, there have been a lot of changes in the banking uh, uh, sphere. I mean, we've gone through a, uh, you know, uh, the, through the uh, financial crisis. Uh, that was a significant event. We have had a major restructuring of how uh, banks operate under the, the Dodd-Frank Act. I think we're in, a, uh, in an environment now where we're actually uh, trying both uh, the regulatory agencies and groups like yours, John, assessing what the impact is in the, in the area of CRA. Uh, again, given you know, technology and the regulatory changes, whether it's increased capital or re liquidity requirements for the largest banks, limitations on merger, uh, practical limitations on merger and acquisition activity, we're, we're grappling with some of the same issues. Uh, some institutions, uh, as a result of cost and overhead and uh, with regulatory requirements, are scaling back you know, the brick and mortar uh, uh, delivery system. Uh, from a CRA standpoint, we do think that's important to look at what the record of opening and closing those institutions are at a minimum in terms of assessing uh, the context in which we evaluate those institutions. But as a matter of uh, you know, uh, statutory requirements, uh, there's very limited direct authority over uh, the closing of uh, branches in LMI areas. Uh, I would point out, I mean, having been uh, long-term interest in community development and your uh, back, uh, 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 background here, uh, banks and businesses and uh, neighborhood stability are key to community and individual development, right. particularly in low to moderate income communities. Right. And unfortunately, you're seeing less and less of those branches located in LMI areas. So yeah. appreciate, whoops. We'll and uh, I don't want to you know, be daring here and use a prop, but uh, <laughs> I don't believe that telephones are the way for the future. Here, here. With a flip top, <laughs> flip phone. That's a good statement. <laughs> at, least right. for the, at least for this elderly <laughs> regulator. <laughs> Well, look, I know your time is limited, so yeah. I, I got time for one more yeah. question, and uh, this, is a, this is an interesting one. Um, so in the last year, we've heard these stories about uh, regulatory capture, that mm -hmm. is re regula regula regulators, staffers, being a little too cozy with the banks, mm -hmm. too close to them, and uh, particularly the stories have been about the Federal Reserve, so not picking, picking on you at this point, but is this a problem at the OCC, and what actions can be taken to prevent this regulatory? How, how do we, how can we rely upon mm -hmm. the independence and the mm -hmm. balance and the fairness that you would expect from a regulator to make sure that consumers, mm -hmm. as well as, ba as bank interests, are both considered in the process of yeah. regulating? No, I, I, it's critical to the effectiveness of a bank regulatory like the OCC to, to avoid even the appearance of regulatory capture. Uh, and something that uh, I did early on in my tenure as uh, comptroller is actually engage a group of uh, impartial international uh, bank supervisors to evaluate our large bank and midsize examination programs. And we've taken uh, several steps to improve both our organizational structure uh, uh, and our policies to address uh, those issues. Uh, we do not want to have any basis for anyone to think that uh, the OCC, either as an agency or individually, is subject to regulatory capture. Yeah. One of the hallmarks of the American uh, financial system, which is still the best in the world, is the fact that we have independent regulatory agencies. And uh, that's something that uh, I've spent my 30-year you know, career uh, doing, and I hope to continue to do that at the OCC. 
There's one last question. I think it's just the yes or no answer. Okay, I, I hate those at hearings, so. Uh, um, <laughs> it's better not be a hearing type of question, John. <laughs> it's not a hearing question, but it is the question of would you support expanding CRA to credit unions? Well, uh, yes, I can tell you that the <laughs> Bank Commissioner Thomas Curry did. Uh, What's that? Bank Commissioner Thomas Curry did support oh, that. Cool. Uh, All, right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thanks,